welcome to Chit Chat Money. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer interview industry experts and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Money is a CCM Media Group podcast. Ryan and Brett are also general partners at Arch Capital, and Arch Capital may have positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Money by Ryan or Brett or any other podcast guests is not formal advice or recommendation. Now, please enjoy this episode. All right. Welcome in. This is the Tuesday Not So Deep Dive episode on Chit Chat Money. My name is Brett Schaefer, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Henderson. Today on our what we call the Not So Deep Dive episode, we analyze one stock by covering its business model, ownership, financials, future growth opportunities, and much more. After you listen to this episode, we hope you get a better perspective on the company and where it sits as a stock and its position within its industry. This month, we are transitioning to covering consumer packaged goods or CPG brands. I think I can name the ones we're doing off the top of my head, but Ryan, help me out here if I forget. Today, we're covering Monster Beverage, which owns Monster Energy. Then we're doing Pepsi. And then we are doing... We're, we're doing Philip Morris next. Philip Morris, oh, oh, then Pepsi. Okay. Philip Morris then, International. Then so, for our Arch Capital episode, we're going to do Nintendo, which is sort of consumer goods in, in a way um, with their hardware. But And, and they've got some toys, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Consumer goods slash entertainment slash tech. Yeah. Video games are a hard one to pin down for the sector. Before we dive into Monster... I, we've been doing these themes for a while. I think we should address, we should talk a little bit about the themes broadly at the start of this and maybe at the end, see, see if our opinions have changed at all. Going into the CPG month, what are kind of your conceptions of the space as a whole? My overview without going too deep is you can find some great profitable, durable businesses, but typically low growth. Um, and you, you, I think a lot of people look at them like this. They usually trade at high valuations and you kind of wait, 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 wait until they have a low valuation at some point. That's my conception. Maybe it will change after we cover these, but that seems to be mine after we covered Monster as well. Or yeah, Research I I Monster. I, yeah. I, All right. Or yeah, you're... I, you're, I, you're I would just monster. add, I think these can, if they are... If they are successful, I think they can be some of the best businesses in the world and provide some of the best returns, as you'll see with Monster. I think it might be the best performing stock of all time, or at well, least over the last twenty years. Sorry, since yeah, since two thousand, yeah. Um, so I, I'm excited to see what the like blueprint is for that, or discuss what the blueprint is for that, and see if it's replicable for other businesses. But um, yeah, I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Why don't you talk about our sponsor and allow me to share my screen? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me do that for you. Uh, today's episode is presented by. Can you share the screen? Okay. Today's episode is presented by Stratosphere.io. It is our home screen for fundamental research. It is the best web-based research terminal for company-specific metrics like KPIs, segment revenues, clean data visualizations. As Ryan is sharing for the YouTube and Spotify audience right now that are watching on video. You can chart all the historical financials for a company like Monster Beverage, as Ryan showed earlier there. Their revenue, as we'll talk about during this episode, has been just durable, double-digit growth. I think 20% growth for 30 years, which is just astounding. We'll kind of get into why some of these CPG companies like Coca-Cola, like some of the cigarette companies, and like these energy drink companies can put up that durable growth for so long and how they've been able to expand internationally. But Stratosphere is a perfect way to visualize that. It's a perfect way to supplement your research and save you time and frustration. I think that's the biggest thing that we get out of using Stratosphere is the time and the frustration. And I just saw that they passed 10,000 users, which is great since they've been launched for less than a year. I think our listen, any listener to this show would love to try them out and add on and keep them marching higher because we want them to succeed as well. It is much better than the frustrating, old, dodgy stuff you might use at Yahoo Finance. So switch over 
to Stratosphere. Use them to track your companies. Use them to research. Okay, that is stratosphere.io. Ryan, let's get into Monster. What is this company and what is their history? Yeah, Monster is based more or less the creator and the seller of a variety of different energy drinks. I, I say more or less just because the manufacturing is still outsourced, but really they develop and sell a bunch of different energy drinks across 142 countries and through really uh, slowly developed and or slowly cultivated web of distributors uh, around the globe. And that includes full service bottlers and distributors, uh, as well as retail grocers, specialty chains, convenience stores, gyms. R- the majority is through full service bottlers and distributors that really do it for them that, that go and that's out and, Coca- of- and, and that's Coca-Cola. They have a giant partnership with them. I yeah. We'll talk about, you'll talk about that in the history, I'm assuming. Yeah. And, and if you see, I mean, if you're reading through the 10 K, you're going to see TCCC. I think, I think I got the right amount of C's there uh, a number of times. And that is the Coca-Cola company and they really dominate the distribution for monster. However, uh, Monster does go directly to their own uh, uh, stores as well. A, a lot of convenience stores, a lot of gyms. Um, but yeah, Coca Cola has really helped bolster that distribution, especially across the globe. Um, but Monster itself breaks its brands into three, basically three reporting segments. There's one extra one, which is really just their they develop some of their own flavors. Um, but the three are Monster Energy Drinks, Strategic Brands, and Alcohol Brands. Monster Energy Drinks, this includes all of Monster's sales of ready-to-drink bottles. So think your typical Monster can. Um, and it's all the different variations. So there's the classic Monster with the green logo on the black bottle um, or the black can. There's the white one that's very popular as well, all that kind of stuff. There's This also includes Java Monster Coffee, a whole bunch of different variations of that as well. Monster Dragon Ice Tea and its Rain brand, which they introduced in 2019. A lot of people don't know that's under the Monster umbrella, but um, Rain, which has been really successful, um, growing their own, kind of carving out their own market share within uh, energy energy drinks as a whole, is uh, included there as well. Um, and overall, Monster Energy Drinks, as a percentage of total revenue, total overall revenue is 92%. So this really dominates the bulk of the business. Um, The second one here is strategic brands. This segment refers to Monster's sale of concentrates or beverage bases to their bottling partners. So in this case, the bottling partners will actually combine it with some sugar or flavor, typically whatever Monster tells them to combine it with. um, And then, then they'll kind of do the sale or, or they'll pass it on to the distributors. But some of the recognizable names in this category include Burn, Full Throttle, and NOS. NOS is probably the most popular that I can think of um, from that category. I believe Burn was actually belonged to Coca-Cola initially and was transferred in the, the deal they did in 2014, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, that accounts for 6 revenue, really kind of small. And then the third one, and this one's Maybe the one people are optimistic about or, or uh, maybe where some of the most opportunity lies is the alcohol brand. So in 2022, a year ago, Monster acquired Canarchy, which gave them an entrance into the alcoholic beverage category. This category includes all sales of either kegs or ready-to-drink alcoholic beverages. Some of the valuable brands people might know um, that they acquired were Jaya Lai, Dale's Pale Ale. They have like the apricot hefeweizen and then they have a line of hard seltzers that really aren't that popular um or they weren't that popular prior to the acquisition but they're working to kind of um revamp that and 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 really it, it feels like they're buying it more for the infrastructure the licenses distribution network because I, I think it requires its own sort of specifications with with whenever something can contains alcohol but that can only really accounts for two percent of revenue um that was excluding a month of reporting, but really it's still small relative to the overall Monster business. And then as for the manufacturing side of things, as I mentioned earlier, Monster still outsources that process to third parties. This means that Monster is responsible for just seeing the ingredient, the flavors, which as I mentioned, they develop a lot of their own flavors, the juices, they got to purchase the aluminum for the cans, they got to purchase the bottles, the caps, 
and those are delivered to their bottlers and co-packers, which go out and, and, and actually assemble them. And so those are the largest contributors to cost of revenue for Monster. And as we'll talk about in earnings, it's really been the 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 driver of mul- the driver of margin compression because those costs have gone up over the last kind of year or two. And and it's been they've they haven't necessarily passed it through directly yet, or it's taken some time to pass it through. So those are big ones. Supply chain, requ- they, they they move a lot of inventory. Um, so they're responsible for that, which has been expensive as well, increasingly expensive over the last couple of years. So margins have come down a bit because of that, but that's sort of the basics of the business. Do you think I'm missing anything there? I don't think so. No. We'll talk about their the potential, the upside, the downside, if it's risky of going into the alcohol business during the future growth opportunity. So we'll hit that one again and potentially we'll hit the, you know, how, how do I say it? Whether it's just going to be more of an energy drink story this decade as well and whether the alcohol is actually going to matter. But yeah, no, I think I think that's it. Okay. Let's go through some of the history before we get into the specifics of the business. But um there's actually some fascinating history here, and some of it is kind of hotly debated. So I'll talk about that in a second. But the company was officially founded in the 1930s by Hubert Hansen and his sons with the focus of selling natural juices to film studios and retailers in Southern California. I'm not sure why the focus was on film studios, but it was. And if you recognize that last name, Hansen, it's, it's, it ultimately ended up becoming Hansen's natural juice, which a lot of people, I, I don't know if that was just a West Coast thing, but I, I still remember that brand uh, pretty distinctly. Um, kind of, it was it was really popular. I, I thought growing up. I, I don't know if it's still uh, still around, but um, yeah, that that was sort of the origins of the business. Um, and that company went through a bunch of different corporate changes. Kind of got passed down to his kids, um, Hubert Hansen's kids, and then ultimately the business ended up going bankrupt um, or filing for bankruptcy in 1998 or 1988, I should say. Um, and it was acquired by the California Co-Packers Corporation. And then it was afterwards, it was renamed Hanson's Natural Company. And then it was sold to the now current management, um, which were two South African entrepreneurs, uh, which Brett will talk about in a little bit. But from there, the business really starts, starts to take a shift. That's when, um, shift, I, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and it kind of becomes an interesting story because they, they really started to grow. Uh, the Hanson's Natural side, and then in ni- or in 2002, April of 2002, Hanson's Natural launched the Monster brand. Keep in mind the year prior to that launch, so 2001, the company did 92 million dollars in sales and three million dollars in net income. So this was a three million dollar net income business prior to Monster. For context, this year, so 21 years later, Monster generated. $1.2 billion in net income. So they've gone in the last 21 years, they've gone from $3 million in earnings to $1.2 billion. Uh, probably the most successful story over the last 21 years that I can think of. Maybe you think Apple trumps that? Maybe? I don't know. Uh, it, yeah, it does yeah. Matter. I mean, on a size, yes, of course. But within the CPG space, this is the most successful new brand within CPG the last two decades in something like tech. Yeah, Apple. I mean, Apple's definitely bigger, but yeah. Anyways, the uh, the controversy is really around the early branding and its ties to the war in Iraq. So, uh, rumors are that the company used, and this not even necessarily rumors; it's, it's very clear they used military like branding to appeal to the pro war sort of patriotism that was rampant, kind of right after nine eleven, and it was very sort of aggressive. Um, I don't want to say monsterish because it sounds like a pun, but like uh, intense branding, which I think really appealed to that. And so there, I, I I found this quote. There was this long kind of thesis paper on on some of sort of the ramifications of this and and how they benefited from the pro war kind of sentiment at the time. Um, it says the camouflage pattern on the monster assault flavors can with its accompanying exhortation to declare war on the ordinary and the company's wide use of militaristic and violent rhetoric would seem to necessitate an acknowledgement of U.S. military action since 9-11 and since monster started 
in quotes, cooking up its killer energy brew the following year. However, even while employing militaristic imagery, the Assault 15 can's text includes a written disavowal of being for the war or against the war, so it doesn't have any reference, and Monster denies any political standing on any war. However, I mean, they really care. Why is, I don't know why this is a big deal. So what if this is what the soldiers want to drink? Is this supposed to be illegal? No, it, it's just how they kind of benefited and, and probably someone that was uh, not, uh, didn't right. have a similar stance. And it was just kind of a study of how they benefited um, mm, okay. because this was, and, and you listed that po- business wars podcast, like this was how they got such tremendous product market fit. Was and, and for, to that. Yeah. And for listeners, the biggest context I would want uh, to, that anyone needs to know is that Red Bull came onto the scene earlier and they had more of a, you know, coastal, richer people, you know, you have the Red Bull, it's uh, a so- not soda, you have the Red Bull, vodka Red Bull at the clubs. It was more of a, okay, I'm a more of a wealthier partier type. And Monster wanted to go for the people that looked at Red Bull and kind of scoffed at that expensive drink. Although they still charge the same amount where both of them are higher priced uh, than a soda, a juice or something like that. Yeah, it was kind of a f- a f- feels like Red Bull targeted more like the fun thrill as opposed to Monsters, which was like intense kind of. I don't want to say extreme sports, extreme extreme sports. Yeah, no. Um, so I don't know if uh, I guess I, I don't know if they were like whatever pro war. It doesn't really matter, but there were clearly appeals to that sentiment. Um, for example, they had a partnership with Call of Duty early on. Um, you hear them reference the U.S. military a number of times in the 10K as a, as a big customer. Um, and so that, that really did help the company find remarkable product market fit. And over the next decade, so from 2002, the launch to 2012, energy really, the energy drinks really helped the business grow. And, and by 2012, it was the largest segment for them. And so um, they, they re they renamed the company Monster in 2012. And two years later, 2014, Coca-Cola bought a major stake in the business for just over $2 billion in an attempt to make Monster its, in quotes, exclusive energy play. I think this is, well, hindsight, a great move by Coke, but Along with the deal, Coke transferred their energy brands to Monster, and Monster handed over their non-energy brands to Coke. And so that's where Monster got, like I think it was Burn and one other one, really not a big part of the business. But what they really got was Coke's distribution capabilities globally. And that's been a massive driver for uh, and domestically uh, for, for Monster over the last decade. I put in here, if you if you read the newsletter, if you subscribe to our Substack, I've got a map of the distribution that Coca-Cola has. It's basically everywhere on the globe except Africa and some of the Middle East. Um, but everywhere else seems to be pretty much covered. Yep. And I will say again, subscribe to the newsletter to get some of the charts, info, all the data we may talk about on the show. It is free and goes along with every Not So Deep Dive episode. The link is in the show notes. Okay. Let's get to industry competition. Pretty simple one, but I think I was surprised, at least without studying this industry beforehand, how new the category is. Because Red Bull, I think it really became uh, maybe not a worldwide phenomenon, but somewhat of a worldwide phenomenon with Red Bull in the 90s. And then it didn't even start becoming, I'm talking about the energy category in general, the the energy drink category, the carbonated one, whatever you want to define it, didn't really become a global one until maybe 10, 15 years ago. It kind of became a mainstay in a lot of people's lives. Uh, If we look at the energy drink industry today, it is quite large. It's estimated to be sized at about $86 billion around the globe and is growing at just below 10% annually on a revenue basis. However, the way I like to look at it, is monster beverage or these monster energy drinks they're actually competing in the entire packaged drinks market so which is mostly not alcohol as well as with coffee so i think of them mainly competing with sodas and coffee or tea or juices uh for someone's drink and this total at industry is estimated to do over 200 billion in annual revenue that analysts analysts expect to double this decade around the globe with a lot of international growth. Uh, the majority of industry growth is coming from the non-alcohol and non-hot drinks. So Monster Energy, the energy 
drink companies are taking months, or excuse me, are taking market share. And it gives these companies a nice little long-term tailwind. Now, it's not guaranteed that this tailwind is going to continue into the future, but this is the tailwind where Monster Energy was able to grow at a, a 20% revenue clip because the industry was growing at 10% a year or higher, and they were gaining market share. We'll talk about their market share probably throughout this episode. I don't know if we could count on them gaining any more market share around the globe, but they are one of the leaders now, and it has turned into quite the duopoly. Now, if we look at competition, the main one is Red Bull, and then there is Rockstar, but Rockstar is kind of turning into, it's really fading into irrelevance. Um, and I, I, there also are com- is competition from the non-energy drink stuff. I think of coffee, soda, pe- you know, Coca-Cola, and Pepsi for what people grab for that daily drink. Um, I think the big question investors can ask is how much of you know the soda drinking can it replace? How much of the coffee drinking can it replace? Uh, that's how I view it on the long-term opportunity in the competitive landscape. And then for the newsletter, I have a nice graphic that shows in 2020, the market share, it's somewhat similar across the energy drink brands. Although someone like Celsius and the healthy drink ones, we will talk about them during the low light section and their risk and maybe how we see that potential uh, from the market. But yeah, if we look at at the market in 2020, Red Bull had 43% of the market, Monster had 39%, Rockstar had 10%, and then Amp and NOS each at 3%, and then everyone else is smaller. So really, and Rockstar has declined since then. So really, Red Bull and Monster dominate this industry with more than 80% market share. It has turned into a duopoly. And we'll maybe talk about later again during the analysis section on whether this has turned into a Coke Pepsi dynamic or if the industry is a lot more fluid with competitors than the soda market. But let's go to management I, ownership or Ryan, you have anything to add before I go to management ownership? Yeah. The other thing is monster technically is larger now. Um, if you include monster rain and NASA's one uh, compared to Red Bull. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I, they had a chart. If you look at their investor day, they have a, a lot of slides. However, they're just really hard to put into the podcast as visually they're not the best, which I actually think is kind of bullish for their management team because when the slides are so good and the shareholder letters are so good, I think, hmm, how many people did you have working on that? That might be a little inefficient for your research. But yeah, if you combine those, uh, I believe all of the monster beverage energy brands outpace Red Bull. But they're neck and neck. They're pretty darn close and it's been fairly stable. Although, again, we will talk about Monster has lost a little bit of market share to these health focused energy drink brands. But let's move to management and ownership. Things are going to feel a bit outdated at the moment because we are at the time of the year in April where we have the old, the new annual reports, but we don't have the new proxy filings for a lot of companies. But I think with Monster, it'll be fine. So, Monster's beverage is run by two men. Rodney Sachs and Hilton Schlossberg. They have been on the board of directors since taking over the company in 1990 and run the company as co-CEOs today. A little bit that potentially could be a red flag if that was a new dynamic. And I know they just made Schlossberg the co-CEO, but they essentially said that they just wanted to do what was actually happening under the hood. So these two guys have been running the company together for over 30 years. I don't think the co-CEO thing should be any sort of concern. And I don't think it's an indication that Sachs is deciding to leave because he, or planning to leave, excuse me, because he has been out with the company as the CEO for uh, since 1990. Um, and then if we look at the rest of the executive team, I don't need to list them out. You can go read it all yourself, but they have all had long tenures at the business, which I think is a good sign. They actually just bumped up their long term. I believe it was the marketing guru, I forget his name, but his last name was Hall to the board of directors. Um, and as Ryan mentioned, Coca Cola has a big stake in this business. So they have a few members on the board. I want to have a discussion question here. What do we think of the frenemy relationship between Coca-Cola and Monster? Was this a good decision by Monster to sort of say, hey, look, you can get 20% of our business. You can get a big amount of the upside here with the company if you own 20% of us, but you're going to stay out of the energy drink markets. And they kind of eliminated one of the key competitors or potential competitors. Yeah, I mean, I think... uh the answer is obvious since we've seen the results since the, the deal was done. This was a huge, they were huge beneficiaries from this deal um, because of, because of both eliminating the competitor, but also uh, obviously the distribution with uh, the uh, Coke's, Coke's kind of network. 
Yeah, and I wonder how this relationship is going to um, change or not over the next decade as Monster seems a bit intent on going out of the energy drink category and expanding into this alcohol stuff, which I know Coca-Cola doesn't have a huge presence in, but they are t- uh, going into the water category as well, which Coca-Cola does have a big presence in, and maybe you know they, they expanded into some other stuff, and I, I wonder if Coca-Cola is going to be mad at them about that, and that might upset them, but we'll see. Hasn't hasn't had any effect so far. If we look at their executive compensation, they have the standard boilerplate compensation consultant uh, BS. I will say that seems to be on every company. There was a good tweet from an account, I forget who it was, on Twitter saying that it is not surprising when executives consult another company to make their compensation schemes that they keep overpaying them, something along those lines. Uh, and that's the case here. So executives get base salary, annual bonuses based on adjusted operating income targets, and then long-term performance stock units based on adjusted earnings per share targets. It's fine. It's not great, but it's fine. Uh, I, I, there there are some concerns here. I don't, I don't. These are a little bit. You know, the compensation is not a big deal, but uh, it wasn't my favorite. If we look at the total cumulative or uh, cumulative executive compensation across the board, it was forty million dollars in twenty twenty one, or about one percent of annual gross profit. So no concern about maybe a situation where we're getting paid hundreds of million dollars a year. Ryan, I saw you unmute yourself. You have something to add before I go into my red and yellow flags I found on the proxy statement. Yeah, I was just gonna say like the adjustments. Obviously, we don't prefer adjusted numbers, but because stock based compensation is really kind of negligible. The adjustment bet- or the difference between adjusted operating income and operating income is, is very small at this business. Yep. All, yeah. I, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, but I did see some major yellow, you know, red and yellow flags. First, I had the compensation based on adjusted numbers. That's just a minor one. Second one, the two, and I'll call them the founders here because they really did found this business. Uh, they pay themselves a ton in salary and bonuses when they are already immensely rich from owning the stock. Now, they're the ones that created basically, what, $55 billion in shareholder value out of nothing. So sure, fine. You can pay yourself a lot, but it does, you know, Buffett created what, $600 billion in shareholder value out of nothing. And he pays himself $100 million a year and, and earns his money in an honest way. 100000 100000 a year, right? He yeah. And, uh, million. Oh, I said $100 million. Oops. Yeah. 100000 Uh Third one, the founders get paid fees. This is I've never seen this before. Uh, this, is the, this is the most greedy and maybe unethical thing I've seen uh, from this one. Is the founders get paid fees for two social clubs by the company? Didn't like that one at all. Fourth one, there are related party transactions, uh, and the most concerning one is that Sachs, who this is the CEO, charters his private jet back to the company and forces them to pay him. Which I, I just, you know, lend it out for free, man. Let's just not, right? I don't know if they're required to make some payment there, but why don't you just get a payment from another company? I don't like the related party transactions for stuff. And when I looked at the services that they were getting provided that they described, don't need to put through all of them here. They were things that there are hundreds of different companies out there. And the fact that they went for five or six times for related party deals on some of these things, just not the best. Um, and then they also make the ownership stakes of the two founders incredibly confusing to parse through. I didn't like that, but I don't think that's a huge deal. My read on the situation is that this is not going to, uh, you know, there's no means going to tear the business down. It's not going to mean the stock, it doesn't mean the stock's going to collapse or anything like that. I don't see, you know, it wasn't all fraud or anything like that. But my read is that there is a lot of greed here from these two, and unnecessary greed. They're already immensely rich. Why don't you just be a little bit more, I don't know, rewarding for your long-term shareholders? What are your thoughts, Ryan, on seeing those things? Yeah, I mean, the I have seen some of this stuff before. Like I've seen management get their gym memberships paid for. I forget what business I was looking at. Hey, Equinox is expensive nowadays, 300 bucks a month, you know? But no, yeah. I mean, that, that's, uh, never, that's never good either. I don't like that. Security, but- we've seen the security a lot, right? Security is a big one. The but like the, I think you get a pass when, like like it, it, this should not emit you from owning 
the business. No, yeah, yeah. Um, I think managers get a pass too when obviously they've done what they have done, and then also when they own twenty percent of the business, roughly. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean it's not unethical. I still don't. I still sure. think it's. I still. It still rubs me the completely the wrong way. Yeah. If we look at ownership, though, to close out this section, Coca Cola owns nineteen percent of the company. Sachs and Schlossberg own around nine percent each. Those are the largest shareholders outside of the, what you call them, the passive ones, the passive aggregators. Okay, Ryan, let's hit earnings. What did the last full year of this company look like? Yeah, the other thing I'll add, and I forgot to throw this into the history, but I usually don't, but I think it's important to do it for this company. The stock performance since the introduction of the Monster brand, so April of 2002, the stock is up 120,000%. That means $10,000 would be worth $12 million today. This is by far the best performing stock since 2000. And I mean by a long shot. Apple, for reference, is up 16,000% since 2000. So 120,000% versus 16,000%. I mean, I would still take Apple's returns, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of just mind boggling to, to look at some of those returns. Let's talk about the earnings for the full year, though. Um, $6.3 billion in net sales. They, they do have a gross billings f- figure, which basically um, it isn't that important. And it usually is just like in line with net sales, but it just is an ad back with promotional activity. So um, just look at it on a net sales basis. That's, that's the thing that matters. Um, 50% gross margin this year versus 56% last year. A lot of that came from, and, and it started to tr- trickle back upwards in, in uh, Q4. But um, a lot of that, like I said, a lot of supply chain pressure and and rising costs of aluminum. They said foreign exchange too. Yeah, big foreign exchange. Well, um, I think thirty six percent of their revenue comes from outside the U.S. So um, they do generate a lot of sales internationally. Um, but they did say, without saying it explicitly, that they expect margins to kind of trickle back up to where they were um, slowly kind of sequentially over the next uh, four or five quarters. Um, $1.6 billion in operating income. This is kind of important. That's 25% operating margins. Over the last 10 years, their average operating margin has been 32%. Over the last six years, roughly, so from 2016 to 2022, it's been 35%. So this is a significant decrease, lots of margin compression here. Um Worth kind of monitoring that. If 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 we get some sort of a, I guess, rebound in margins, you you, it's going to make the multiple look a lot cheaper than it is today. The other thing I'll add is they've seen a big increase in inventory over the last two years. Now part of that is um, when you know when you have inflation, the cost of that inventory is higher, so that's part of it. But also they've just been adding more and more to basically be able to fulfill their different channels. Um, And so that's been kind of a big discrepancy between the cash flow numbers and and their operating income figures. On top of it, accounts receivable has gone up as well. So those two big changes to working capital has really kind of hurt cash flow in the short term. But I suspect that cash flow will continue to be generally quite close to to operating income. Brett, you want to add something? Yeah. So just clarify, because you froze a little bit on the margin, it was 36% recently. And then over like a 12 year period, it was 32%. I uh, just want to say that one again. Yeah. Sorry. I, I didn't notice that I froze there. So uh, last 10 years, 32% is the average that includes this year from 2016 to 2022 though. So basically prior to COVID and all these big cost increases, it was 35%. So, and, and then last year is 25%. So if you're looking at this on a trailing operating income basis, it's going to look very depressed relative to kind of the last uh, last decade. Um, but operating cash flow, like I said, it generally tends to trend close to operating income. However, there was a big 23% decrease this year due to that uh, in increase in inventory and accounts receivable. When yep, we look I'll at have cap- a, all the all the chart in the sh- the letter as a, the conversion from operating income to cash flow, so people can kind of look at that and see how it's slightly lower consistently. Yeah, and then capex is usually pretty light. It was elevated this last year, but it's it's typically about under just under ten percent of of operating cash flow. If you look at it 
over over the kind of I think last twenty years. Um, but I wanted to hit on some of the long term numbers because I think for a business like this, looking at the long term averages is really important because you can get fluctuations in any given year. But since twenty twelve, Monster Energy case sales, so volume of cans essentially, has grown at twelve percent a year. Average net sales per case has actually decreased by 1% a year. So uh, you can call that basically price. Um, interestingly enough, I, th- I think when most people think has Monster increased prices, you'd probably say yes, and they have. Monster has, but because of the geographic and product mix, so um, expanding internationally and having some of the lower cost cans, so like Rain, do well, they've had sort of a decrease in that average price per case because um, they're, they basically they're just not as they don't have as good of market share as as they do in the U.S., so they kind of have to uh, be a low cost, be a lower cost in a lot of these markets, and so that's had a big effect on their average sales per case. And then, like I said, operating margin has been around thirty percent since two thousand five, and it's it's trended, it's been lumpy, but it's trended upwards. And shares outstanding have come in by about fourteen percent since twenty sixteen, so they tend to buy back around one to two percent of their shares each year, and it's been pretty steady. Um, so those are it some did, it did go up. Yeah, it did go up during the Coca Cola deal, though. That's kind of yeah. right after the Coca Cola deal. So okay. when you look at the shares outstanding chart, they did that deal, probably value accretive, but it, it'll mess up that pretty looking shares outstanding chart. And hopefully over the next 10 years, they can keep it steadily decline at one to 2% a year. I will note, though, I did share that chart for the video watchers. The cases one is one of the key KPIs you can look at on Stratosphere. So Check out that visualization. You can easily that that's the type of stuff that they're, you know, aggregating for us, and we don't have to chart ourselves. So just check them out, stratosphere.io. All right, Ryan, yeah, balance sheet now or anything else on margins? Well, I'd just say, that, I mean, you look at the earnings over the last decade; it's been really steady, yeah. steady, and really impressive. Um, balance sheet, it's really straightforward. They've got two point seven billion dollars in cash and short term investments. Most of that is in short term investments, but they keep about a billion dollars in, in cash. Um, no debt, not not a, a single lick of debt. I, I mentioned that inventories have gone up, accounts receivable have gone up, so that kind of hurt cash flow. But um, yeah, not not a lot of liabilities here. Um, they will be receiving some cash this year with their settlement. Uh, from their settlement with Bang Energy, so they basically sued them over improper branding. Uh, I, I don't have the specifics of the arbitration, but yeah, they're look that receive, up if you're in. Yeah, we're not going to hit on the show, but yeah, I think it was around like three hundred million dollars in cash. Um, so you can maybe just add that to the balance sheet. I, I think there's also like a royalty deal that's involved there as well. But historically, they've used their cash to either buy other companies like Canarchy or invest into new products or buy back their stock. That's about it. Those are really the only things they they do with their cash. Yep. Uh, the big highlight there for me was that it's nice and clean and consistent, which is something we look for uh, for, for companies that, well, specific, you know, you might look for more opportunistic stuff within capital allocation businesses or conglomerates and stuff like that. But for operating companies, we like to look for that consistent Use of cash. All right, I'll hit valuation super quick. Market cap right now fifty four point nine billion. Enterprise value is going to be slightly lower at about fifty three point six. I have, although I believe my net debt, debt number might be a little off. No big deal though. And I'm only going to use one number here, and that is enterprise value to operating income. I think operating income or EBIT or earnings before taxes is the best metric to look at here. The cash flow can get a little bit muddy from time to time, but typically the cash will come back to the company. Right now, given the depressed margins, they are trading at a very high multiple of 33.8. By my count, as of this recording, I would just, if you think their margins are going to come back, just take that earnings number or take that revenue number, slap a 35% margin or slap a 32% margin on it and look at what the earnings would be and what the multiple would be there. It would be probably in the high 20s. I, I didn't write it down, but still a premium multiple for sure the market is pricing in. Quite a bit of future growth here. And that's all I'll say. Let's move to anecdotal evidence. Ryan, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I don't personally drink that much energy drinks. I'm, I'm kind of a coffee guy. I used to. Um, I had less of probably like brand loyalty compared to other people, but the friends that I know that drink energy drinks are pretty brand loyal. Um, and I would say 
monster is probably the dominant one. Um, it, you know, people that drink monster continue to drink monster. It's very addictive, high brand loyalty. People aren't going to bat an eye uh, about a three dollar twenty five cent price versus a three dollar fifty cent price, at least here in the U.S. And they 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 basically said that in the last earnings call. They they raised prices by six percent this year in the U.S. Saw little to no attrition. So, um, yeah, I think it's a wonderful product and and a, a really durable business. Yeah, not wonderful for you. Wonderful product for shareholders. It might be quite unhealthy those sugar ones, but. They are actually moving into sugar-free, which I thought they could have been a little bit late to the game on that sugar-free stuff. I, I don't know why they haven't done that for the last decade, but hey, that could be, you know, it could be another growth opportunity because I know Red Bull has been big on the sugar-free stuff and these health drinks, or I wouldn't call them health drinks, but the energy drinks that we'll talk about later that are focused on branding themselves as health or health-focused, like Celsius and that's the leader, but there's other ones. Maybe this is a way to counteract them. They've talked about that as well. But yeah, it's very similar to soda. People don't have, I wouldn't say it's not intense brand loyalty, like with a maybe a musician or even it's not as strong as Apple or Disney where people kind of get intense about it and argue about it with friends. But it's sort of like the soda in my mind where, all right, you'll use it and you're going to do the same one because it tastes good. It's reliable. And you know that if you change, you have risk of, okay, this one's bad for that one time. I'm just going to have the same one every day. It honestly reminds me a lot of the nicotine market, maybe not as much like brand loyalty to the, to the big brands like Marlboro, but you th- like with kind of the up and comer sort of uh, with the health focused products, I think they're kind of similar to the reduced risk products and nicotine. And then you still have like the stalwarts um, with, in this case, Maybe Monster could be similar to the Marlboro, except you actually have no. I'd say that's... Red Bull. I'd say Red Bull because Red Bull's the most premium focused. Maybe wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, except I can't think of is there is there any other second cigarette maker that's like? Yeah, I guess it's almost dominant. like there's two. Yeah, it's almost Marlboro's. like there's two. In, yeah, two in the U.S. because they both have forty percent market share. But and and unlike nicotine, you actually have a uh, an industry that's growing. Yeah, that's a fair point. And soda. Soda, I guess, in some markets is growing, but in the US, I believe volumes have stalled out. Although, don't quote me on that. I think the only other question I have for anecdotal evidence is, is the energy drink market, or has it ended up like Coke and Pepsi with Monster and Red Bull? I'm curious your thoughts. I think it is likely, but I'm not 100% convinced on the durability compared to the, not the Coca-Cola market, but the 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 cola soda market of Coke and Pepsi having absolutely zero competition. I think it is. I think it's similar. I think it would be more if I'm if I'm making an analogy, I'd say it's like probably more like nicotine if there were two Marlboros, but the yeah. I, Coke and Pepsi is a good analogy. Um I wonder if there's more pressure from kind of society regulators to uh, try to limit energy drink, kind of limit the energy drink market. I know obviously there's the stuff with kids. And, yeah, it seems uh, to have passed. It seems to have passed now, but I don't really understand it because a lot of the other stuff has a lot of their products that people consume have a lot of caffeine, right? That's it feels like it has issue. more stigma, more of a stigma yeah. than the soda market. Yet, yeah, I mean, Coca Cola generally. Um, Maybe, I, I I don't want to, this is total conspiracy, but I I I'm a hundred percent. That's that's some advertising warfare from the soda makers or any of the other drink makers or the coffee industry. Hundred percent that they they try to warp everyone's brains into thinking that the energy drinks were evil compared to them when they're very similar and obviously both are are not healthy. But let's move to future growth opportunities, Ryan. What do you have for us here? Because I mean, the big one is just betting on the growth of the energy market. We don't necessarily need to focus on that one, but what do we got outside of that? Yeah, I mean, the obvious growth is more of the same, basically what what they've been doing over the past two decades. But something that's kind of a potential unexpected growth driver, I'd say, is the entrance into the alcoholic beverage category. I know we both kind of have similar future growth opportunities here, so maybe we can like 
parlay some of these questions that we have for each other into one conversation. Um, but they paid $330 million for Canarchy. And I think that was really just a way for them to get sort of, maybe they did the math themselves and said it would be less costly for us to acquire our way in than to try to build out the distribution network ourselves. So uh, there's a quote here uh, from their presentation when they announced the deal. It says, the company, Canarchy, uh, and this is really important, already operates with the dis- with the people, distribution network, licenses, alcohol, beverage, development expertise, manufacturing capability, and infrastructure necessary to grow our alcohol business. They've been sort of experimenting, experimenting or tinkering with some of... Uh, Canarchy's brands, namely uh, the the Seltzer and the Dale uh, Pale Dale Ales. Public, is that what it's called? Pale, no clue. Pale, they're not. Dale, yeah, they're like they're ne- yeah they're niche geography ones right now. So Dale's Pale Ale. That's what it is. Um, anyway, they, they've been tinkering with those, but then they've also launched their own alcoholic beverage, uh, which is called the Beast Unleashed. It's a six percent six percent alcohol content seltzer. And uh, they've launched it in six states now, and they're planning to have it uh, rolled out nationally by the end of the year. Two-part question, and I think we can both answer this. Let's, let, first of all, would we try this? And do you think alcohol can, or the alcohol category can actually truly help drive sales for Monster? Yeah. And just for listeners, these are not four locos. They don't have caffeine and they don't have sugar. So they're pretty much like a hard seltzer um, because I believe caffeine plus alcohol solo drinks are banned now, although a bunch of drink people still combine those things and make their own. Uh, so just, uh, just to be clear, I, I think I would try this, but it wouldn't be my first choice for a drink. I don't know. Yeah. I think I, I'd try I could, it experimentally. Yeah, I definitely try it. I don't like the energy drink taste too much. I will buy, if I'm on a road trip, I will go to a Red Bull if I'm super tired and I need to not fall asleep. That's kind of the only time I'd really go for something like that. But I could see for the people that like that taste of uh, of the red, of the the monster flavor, which it seems to be that, or people get, you know, habitually like that taste. And regardless of whether people think it tastes bad, Remember that a lot of the best selling products in the United States and the world have quote unquote bad flavors. Hershey, Coca Cola is kind of gross the first time you try it. Mountain Dew is absolutely disgusting. It doesn't really matter. And I kind of feel Red Bull. bad. Red, Red Bull is yeah, disgusting. Red, Red Bull Monster co- almost copied that really and just put, slapped on some adjacent branding or, excuse me, not adjacent to uh, conflicting branding to counter position themselves. I think yeah, people would tr- people would try this. There's definitely potential here, but it's a bit uncertain. So I think it can drive some growth if they. You really the thing is you really only need one one winner because you get one sort of brand winner within a new space. Think about the hard seltzer category. You get the truly. You get you know that that one is a little bit um, dynamic, but you only really need one winner and that can kind of drive growth. And yeah, they gotta, it's gotta be a big winner given the size of this business, but I, I think they could, or what are your thoughts? You pessimistic or optimistic about their alcohol venture? Well, I think if someone sees monster and 6% alcohol, I think the first instinct is going to be that this is for loco 2.0, uh, which people like because it's, as long as it doesn't, you know, it won't kill people if it doesn't have caffeine. But you know, people like that. They would like that for sure. Especially, I bet if, a lot know. of the common monster drinkers that are yeah, above the age of twenty-one here in the U.S. would would probably try this. I don't know yeah, if it would be like. I mean, uh, it depends on taste whether or not they'll be. It'll be a staple of their alcoholic beverage appetite. But yeah, um, and you could definitely see people. It's weird. It's a weird dynamic because bars are able to sell a huge thing for the distribution for these energy drink companies. And how they started out was getting into bars and having the non-alcoholic drinks getting used, you know, behind the counter to make these mixed drinks. And I wonder, it's so weird that, you know, other people are going to make them with these caffeinated stuff. But uh, yeah, the only other thing I'd add here is that the benefit of getting out of the, and I'll bring up a chart of getting out of the uh, just energy drink or just the standard energy drink brand is that right now they are at 90% exposure or 90% plus of their business is still within 
the monster beverage or the energy drink category, right, Ryan? And that's not even their strategic brands, which might have some stuff that is still... And if we look here, it's just all of the growth on the shared chart here is from the monster energy drink case sales compared to the strategic brand sales. If they can succeed in this category, it'll give them that diversification like the big CPG giants or get them on their way to being like a Pepsi, a Coke, uh, a Hershey, a, a Unilever. And that really allows for just more diversification where you're not just betting, okay, is Monster going to stick around for 10 years? Because that's a bit riskier because you never know what's going to happen with one brand. Yeah, I think uh, it'd be a bit of a hedge, I guess. Yeah, and it just, I don't know if it makes it a better business, but it makes it, the diversification I think helps. But let, let's move to highlights and lowlights. Ryan, what do you like, dislike about this business? Yeah, the highlights are pretty simple for me. They're strong brand loyalty. It's literally an addictive product. And I think they have solid pricing power, um, especially domestically. The other part, the global distribution network, thanks to Coke, from a standing start, I think that'd be hard to replicate without going through one of the big players. It is worth noting that Celsius basically did a similar deal recently with Pepsi. Um, Smart. Very smart. So there is the way you could potentially do that. And it's not an advantage over Red Bull because Red Bull has sort of that same distribution, but it's it, it's definitely difficult to do if you're like an up and coming energy drink maker. Um, I like the simple, little, simple capital allocation strategy. And then I also think having some Coca-Cola members on your board maybe gives you a little bit of expertise, a, a little bit of like useful advice. If, wisdom. Yeah. Wisdom. Yeah. Maybe. For for someone that has you know is a company that has great relationships with uh, retailers, uh, low lights for me though. I think they could have been a little more aggressive with their balance sheet throughout 2020 and 2021. Um, they easily could have gotten extremely low cost debt. Now, obviously, that's hindsight and rates have risen. But I yeah, just and, yeah. and I'm, I'm being nitpicky. It just feels like you know they just sat on cash and. Yeah, they could have. E- yeah, they could have easily gotten spread out over multiple years, five billion dollars worth of bonds at ten plus years at three percent interest rates. So, yeah, I probably mean, could've less. Could have been, yeah. Well, depends on what year, but yeah, if they really timed it perfectly, they could have gotten it less. But I guess you can't just be super nitpicky on that. But did you have any other low lights? Yeah, I would just say I think it's going to be harder to grow volumes over the next ten years than the last ten. Because uh, I just think growth is less likely to come from growth and distribution because they're already pretty saturated or they have, I shouldn't say they're saturated, they have distribution points all over the globe. So especially with the monster brand, it's not like they uh, can kind of just re, they're not entering these markets for the first time. They can kind of maybe drive success with some of these lower cost uh, uh, products like Rain and stuff like that, NOS. But they're uh, basically, I think they're either going to grow volumes at a slightly slower clip, or they're going to have to make up for some of that revenue growth with price increases, which I, I think they're able to do, but I just don't expect volumes to grow as fast as they did over the last decade. Yeah. And even if they don't put in insane price increases or just execute phenomenally in some of these emerging markets, as maybe we'll just call them on this episode, they can still go revenue at, say, 10%. But that is a big slowdown to historically, it's been at around a 15% to 20% clip. I kind of agree with you there. My highlights, I think they've finally crossed the, the chasm. I don't know if it's, I always confuse the words, chasm or chasm. I think it's chasm, uh, where they built up the brand recognition over the years. And they've, I believe, at least in certain markets, have elevated themselves to the status of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Gatorade, Red Bull, Tropicana, and other CPG drink namestays. I think this is extremely hard to do. It makes it much more difficult for someone to disrupt them, at least quickly. And what I also like is that they are the type of company where I'd almost talk, their marketing strategy seems to be a combination. And this is Red Bull as well. And they really copied Red Bull, but did it for their own demographics. It's a combination of the Coca-Cola marketing strategy of just habitual, you know, hey, have this every day. You'll be happy. It'll help you. And the Nike strategy, where you attach yourself to a lot of athletes. I know they, they're in the extreme sports. I mean, the, their biggest athlete is Lewis Hamilton, which is funny because that 
they're they sponsored the team that is rival to Red Bull. So it's kind of fun in that regard. And then a few of the other ones where they're basically selling, okay, if you want to be like these athletes, if you want to be like these, even these military people, which I guess is they don't do as explicitly, you're, you're going to drink Monster. I think that's really smart. And that can, I, I don't know how, it would be very difficult for someone to disrupt them within that marketing strategy. I guess we'll talk about in my lowlights is the the health focused ones. Uh, other one, consistent repurchaser of shares like that. Already mentioned it. Uh, I think the Coca Cola partnership was a very good master stroke in defending your posi- their position in the marketplace. And then I think the leadership team generally has long, te- or I don't think the leadership team generally has long tenures and they speak frankly, rationally, and conservatively to shareholders. I, I love that about them. Low lights, first one. We already talked about the, them being a bit greedy with the corporate expenses and self-dealing. They'll outline that above. I think the other one that I would like to discuss is the market share gainers within the energy drink category. We've had Celsius growing quickly lately. Before that, it was Bang Energy. Before that, it was, uh, well, Rockstar is, I guess, just as old, but Rockstar was a big competitor, I guess, back in the day. There was Five Hour Energy and others that I'm missing. None of them have shown the ability to meaningfully edge away Red Bull or Monster's market share yet, but I don't think it means they won't. And I'm curious your thoughts on the shift towards the quote-unquote healthy energy drinks becoming more popular because Monster has some products going into this space, but it seems like Celsius has caught quite a bit of fire by you know going to the gym people, trying to go with those type of Instagram influencers and stuff like that and having that sort of niche. And whether I, I kind of think they could maybe get 10 to 15% of the market, but I don't know whether that sort of niche can become a 40% market share in energy drinks. What are your thoughts? I think it's also expanding the market. Um, the women, yeah, it's a women. These we used to be all, not all, but most of the guys and Celsius is big among women. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think, I mean, you're seeing it. The category as a whole is growing. Monster is growing, even though their share might not be. So I'd say it's not necessarily cannibalize. Even if some of these more health focused products grow, it's not necessarily going to cannibalize uh, Monster's business. But let's talk bull case and bear case, unless you have anything else. Nothing else. Okay. For the bull case, I just put some kind of five year assumptions together. And, and I think these are very reasonable assumptions. Um, and, uh, let's basically, let's see where we get with, with these numbers. So let's assume they grow total sales by 12% annually. Their, their last 10 year average has been 12.2%. Um, that's kind of been the annual at the average annual growth operating margins get back to their last 10 year average, which is 32%. So and, and keep in mind, prior to COVID, this was it was at thirty five percent. So if if they can get to around thirty two percent, I don't think that's too unreasonable. Um, if those two things happen by twenty twenty seven, they would be generating about eleven billion dollars in revenue and three point six billion dollars in operating income. Their average enterprise value to operating income has been twenty five times over the last ten years. So let's say it's the same, you'd have a ninety billion dollar enterprise value today. It's about fifty two, fifty three billion. So. Seventy-three percent return over five years, plus some buybacks. Um, that's a good return if they get back to sort of their their average numbers over over the last ten years. And and if they get to thirty-five percent operating margins instead, which is basically to say, like, kind of, I think what they were at prior to the the recent cost increases. And who knows if the cost increases stick around? It's even better return. It's probably a double or more um, over the next five years. Yeah. And remember, any listeners, because we will talk about the bear case, the multiple uh, needs to stay at a fairly high rate there. I'll talk about mine. It's fairly similar. You know, we're at 34 times as of this writing EV to operating income. I think you need margins to expand higher into kind of that 35% plus range and see 10% revenue growth for the next five to seven years. Or you got the 12, maybe 12% revenue growth plus the multiple stays high. And I think they can do that with retaining you know the market share within core monster energy just do what they've been doing and expanding into international markets and then having success with the alcohol category and I'll add one on here is having success with the sugar free and maybe the health focused stuff that they're trying to expand into within the monster energy category to defend their position versus these early upstart market share gainers I think you'll probably do fine 
as Ryan mentioned. But let's move to the bear case. Hard because it seems like such a good business. But Ryan, what do you think? Well, obviously, multiple compression is a big one. Um, and it probably will come in because I think they're under earning right now. So, well, margins are expected to tick up, I should say. So it'll yeah. probably come in. I think that's kind of the the market saying that they expect that. Um, but then the other one is if operating margins over the next five years are closer to 30% instead of 35%. So those cost increases are maybe here to stay, then that, that's going to really hurt returns. Also, like, like I said earlier, I think they have to be more creative to grow revenue from here. It can't just be pure volume increases thanks to the distribution. Um, it's got to be success with the sugar-free category, success potentially with, with the alcohol category or price increases. I think all those are doable. I think they can still grow at a, a really strong rate, but um, I, I just don't think it's all going to come from volume like it mostly has over the last uh, 10 years. So uh, basically, I'd say if costs stay high or the multiple compresses more than people already expect, you, you've probably got, it's it's still going to be a decent investment. I think it's very predictable that this business is going to grow, but it's not going to be a double digit return. It's, it's not going to be last decade's returns over the next 10 years. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in yeah, that we'll scenario, see. in that scenario, in that scenario, in that scenario. Yeah. And, but over the last 10 years, I believe, it's up like 500%. I would really, I mean, it would become a huge business if it was up 500%. But correct me, listeners, don't quote me on that. I think it's up 500% in the last 10 years, but totally cannot be. Yeah, I mean, mine, look, I think this is a really high quality business. I think it's a combination of mostly, you know, Coca-Cola, plus a sprinkle on a little bit of the tobacco companies with that um, market that people don't, you know, politicians love to hate. and. The, the caffeine stuff where it's addictive even more so than a soda and then sprinkle in a little bit of Nike marketing as well. And I really love that. So the only bear case I have is multiple compression, even if earnings grow at 10% a year for five years, but the terminal multiple here in year five is 15 times to 20 times operating income. I don't think investors are going to be happy with the returns. Yeah, that's really it. Simple math. Addictions tend to be good businesses. Yeah, but you know, good, good investments. Yeah, good. Yeah, uh, yes, not good personally. Although I, I don't know how bad Marster Energy really is. Obviously, it's not healthy, but it's not. Yeah, you know, it's not killing the people. I don't think. But mm, yeah, it seems like the market has already established this that the the company is super good. Sort of like a lot of the other top notch CPG brands out there. So, are you more or less interested here, Ryan? I am more interested than before we basically did this not so deep dive, but it would, it would really take a lot. I think for me to say like, I'm going to buy this. It, it, I just think the the expected returns from here are not going to be what they once were. And it's also, I mean, it is very predictable, durable, but it's such a premium and the good CPG businesses get those premiums, but in order for you to get a good return, you have to expect that that premium sticks around because if there's any multiple compression, it's really going to hamper your returns. Yes, I totally agree. At 34 times, I do not really, yeah, it's just not, I don't, I don't, it's not appealing to me. Um, this we're trading at like 20 to 25 times. And, and I thought margins we're going to expand. I, I do think margins are going to expand. It would be way more attractive to me, but obviously, you know, it's not. And that is to say that the market is the market knows how good of a business this is. Yeah, I would be all over this at 15 times earnings. And I wanted to pull up on Stratosphere its historical PE ratios. I wanted to look at, at the GFC. We're at about 16 times in 09, 17 times, 20 times, 05. I guess they maybe had a little collapse after the initial bump of the monster brand. We had about 14, but historically, since this bull market has run, we've kind of been at, and I know PE isn't perfect, so maybe it's not the same. We were kind of at the 20s. So I don't know if I'm expecting it to ever fall below 20 times, but if it is, I'd be really interested in doing some work on it or some some more work. I mean, 
at 15 times, I think it's a great buy, but I don't know if it's ever going to fall to that ever, you know, since the again. Coke deal, since the Coke deal, it hasn't fallen below 25 times. Yeah. And we'll see. We'll see. Never say never. Uh, but yeah. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Remember, subscribe to the newsletter and get the analysis along with each episode. We are covering CPG this month. Next week is Philip Morris International. After that's Pepsi. Then we're covering Nintendo. Subscribe to the show if you want to follow all those episodes. Do it on Spotify, YouTube, or Apple. Easiest way to do it. Remember, we are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. We are general partners at Arch Capital, and clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for listening or watching. We'll see you next time.